Hi, I'm Jezza. Um, so I think you need to know a little bit about me, uh, why I'm sitting in this lovely wheelchair. I've had an accident um, in 2010 and um, I broke my neck. The body works its wonders and um, I'm still here. Yeah, still here and rocking. I'd like to say I'm from humble beginnings. I grew up in between Fairley and Geraldine on a, a sheep and cattle farm. Probably one of the luckiest upbringings you can have anywhere in the world, you know. We have mountains on our doorstep, we have rivers on our doorstep. There's huge amounts of outdoor activities. He was just a very busy, out there, full-on kid. Most babies are born with their back of their head, basic. He was born face up, face out. You know, hello world. <laughs> What'd you go out there for me? And that was pretty much how he lived. Full on with a grin on his face. Every day after school, if it wasn't going down to the river, it was cruising over to the climbing wall, to beautiful valley, this limestone rock to play around and I got an addiction for pushing the limits, and the limits were right there on my doorstep, so I definitely got amongst it real early. When I left school, I was definitely not knowing what I wanted to do. I was like, well, I can go play for a year and then work out what I want to do. So I went and did the outdoor recreation course, and it sort of opened my mind a little bit. And then I got into the rafting, so I was rafting and I was ski patrolling, and I got this real feeling of travel. And I was like, I really need to get out there and experience the world. And uh, I was lucky enough to score a job for Swiss Adventures in Switzerland. I put my kayak on my shoulder, went over to Europe. My dad was like, I'll see you in a week. And then boom, I didn't go back to New Zealand for five years. Morning, Karen. You know, a lot of people, they break themselves. Good old Jezza. Mm, tetraplegia complete. <laughs> Having a severed spinal cord at this sort of level means that everything below runs on autopilot. So things like my bladder, my bowel, it works, but I have to make up systems for it to work properly. Pretty much from the top of my shoulders. I have function of my shoulder muscles. Not much, you know, like the back of my shoulders. My, uh, I don't have triceps and I don't have my, my wrist flexors um, and no hand function. My body doesn't know when I'm hot, it doesn't know when I'm cold, so I have to be very aware of my environment so things don't seriously go wrong. In the morning, we normally get up at around 8, or we'll just do some stretching for Jess's feet, and gets ready, brushes teeth. I am dependent on the help of others for a lot. Jezza is a very practical person. He's got his own idea of how things got done. I really appreciate Karen. 
Because the main thing about Karen is she uh, puts her all into it. It's awesome. Awesome. So the more practical the person, the easier my life is. Well, the job wasn't anything that I was expected. In the interview with Jess, I was like, well, you know, shouldn't be too hard. Um, I've been living now and I'm really good with kids. You're probably just a kid with, like, bigger body parts. We didn't really have a very good start, do we? You need to have a rapport with your carrots. You need to get on with them. The energy is very, very important. Having people that are very positive, um, that have similar interests. That was the major reason why I hired Karen in the first place, is like, was it yeah, really? boom, she's a paraglider. It was, was it really? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Cool. Yeah. And I think we're quite similar in a way that we're super stubborn. Yeah. And then we're smart enough to know each other's mind games. Mm. So we kind of like fight against each other. Mm. Mentally. Now we kick ass, eh? Yeah. yeah. Once I know what I'm doing. Yeah, right once you know what you're doing, yeah. After quite a few years, so I would have been about 33 by now, I decided to go back to Switzerland. I got back into the canyoning scene over there. In Switzerland, with the amazing ancient valleys, you have these massive granite gorges, and they've made these insanely beautiful canyons, smooth rock. But all the waterfalls end up in beautiful potholes, and you approach every descent or every waterfall when you get to it. And then that's the beautiful time when I had my accident, 26th of September, 2010. It was just another day, another day at work. And that day, I remember, I was with my great mate Steve, and we were heading down. We had, like, probably seven clients. We just finished the rappel, so I was cleaning up the ropes while Steve took the clients down to the pullback jump, the next jump. And I just rocked up to that jump, as you do every day, threw the ropes down to Steve, and then went to check the pool and just did a big jump out. That day, instead of doing what I thought I was going to do, I just slipped. And um, instead of flying out over like I should have, I didn't quite get the distance I wanted to. And yeah, I hit my head on, the, on a rock on the way down. Boom. Game changer. I remember lying face down in the waterfall and seeing my hands go in front of my face. I, I'm not stupid, I know what happened. Um, and I pretty much accepted it right then and there. Bugger. Steve, good to see you. Yeah, it was obvious what had happened and it was just like, right okay let's just try and stabilize as much as we can his neck <clears throat> and jezza said to me he says this is my life's changed he says uh, he says it's changed yeah good work steve -O. thanks for saving my life buddy you do the same bro you do the same i had so much like kind of guilt jezza probably tell you afterwards going on thinking like you know Jez might be angry with me for for uh, for uh, saving my life. Yeah, pretty much because I know how much of a full love for life dude you are, and just to, to have that and then to it brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> oh, bro. <laughs> <sighs> uh, crazy. Uh. Once we went to the hospital. I had a whole bunch of mates come in, I remember that bit. And then I see the doctor come in with a great big bag. And that is the last I remember for four weeks. Scary. 
um, totally overwhelming feeling of absolute, really of helplessness. Yeah, this kid that was all muscle and might, he was so covered in tubes and beeping things. They did an operation on the front of my neck and one on the back of my neck. And then my lungs filled with fluids. I got near drowning, it's called. And I also got sand on my lungs. So my lungs failed seven times. His lungs were in a really bad state. So it wasn't just the fact that he'd broken his neck, it was kind of like, it was a bit touch and go with his lungs and stuff as well. So from that point on, it was obviously a pretty long road. He would never have thought, I, I can't do this. Um, that's not really his character. His character is, OK, yeah, I made a uh, boo-boo, but I've got to live with it, so let's get on. It was all about getting myself back again. I got told I do not understand the severity of my situation. And I'm like, well, you don't really understand me. I got back to New Zealand, I had to start my life again. I decided to buy a house. So as we come through this area here, it's got my lovely herbs. <clears throat> and obviously grapevines, because I live in Whitebrae, and Whitebrae is all about wine. Then through here, a nice little section where I can smash out a hot tub whenever I feel like it. I had to find my whole new rift. I had to find new ways to entertain myself, really, and keep my life as exciting and as busy as possible. I grow as much food as I can. This is just new, the, my new raised garden. Believe it or not, I've got a bunch of veggies growing in here, but they're taking their time. Beautiful greenhouse, which is uh, my lovely teepee. Yeah, great storage. And of course, it's always a work in progress, just like my life. Um, so next little bits, we're putting a tank up on the greenhouse so I can have pure water. Having a, a place where I feel real comfortable is really important for my well-being. You absorb your environment. Every year I sort of take on a project to make it a little bit more Jezza friendly. Yeah, it's been a process to get this far. If I go through a day without achieving one small thing, then it frustrates me. Uh, I have to always achieve something. When I was in rehab and not well in Switzerland, I thought about my future, you know? Now living as a tetraplegic could be really important to carry on doing what I do. I looked into the industry to see what was available for people in my situation in the outdoors, and I was quite blown away at the lack of infrastructure. And so I took it upon myself to open up an industry, and um, I started making tracks pretty much from the word go. Adventure is the most awesomest thing that anybody can do. It's the only time in life when you go and do something without planning or knowing what's going to happen. So what Making Tracks does is I go into outdoor companies, I look at their product, and I make it possible through education, adaptation, cooperation, and training. Inclusiveness of the actual adventure tourism is what we're growing with Making Tracks. I've always thought in the back of my mind it would be awesome if I could get all the adventure companies to come to the party. And I've also got a really awesome body that can prove a point. Because if this body can do it, anybody can do it. It's impossible to make rivers paragliding 
accessible. It's not going to happen. But that's not what inclusive tourism is about. Inclusive tourism is about people willing to help and be helped. It's not about being disabled, it's about being a human, you know? The word disabled is really, uh, yeah, of course I've got a disability, but I'm not disabled, you know? I'm really abled, I can do a lot of stuff. What we are doing is going around to companies and helping them develop their product so that they can run their product to the best of their ability, to the best of the ability of the client. Kia ora. Kia ora, Hi, Emma. Nice to see you nice again. Nice to see you. Come in. Kia ora, Karen. Nice to see you. And business managers are going to dial in and we'll catch up with them all. Okay. It's more about having the information and then marketing it and being proud of being an inclusive company. Once Jesus um, talked about uh, making tracks and what it is that he's um, wanting to achieve with our experiences, I'll then go around each of you and get you to talk about the business, the experiences that you operate within your businesses, and if you've had any thoughts already about how you can make it inclusive. Sure, Janet, we have sort of three main experiences at the moment, and really the first one is uh, Valley Walk, so walking up uh, the Waiho Valley uh, riverbed to experience the front or the terminus of the glacier, so that's more of an interpretive walk and there's plenty of opportunity there um, to customise those trips. A lot of you guys have already done activities for people with different abilities, um, but there's no real whole put information and everything put in one place. Um, and a lot of people are unaware and are unsure of what the possibilities are. So it's understanding the possibilities from your end of what you can do to make it as inclusive as you possibly can for all. It can be challenging in the environment that we work in, but there is definitely things that we are doing and that we can still improve on uh, in this in this area. I mean, one of the suggestions that Craig had talked about, and this might have been what you did um, with the customer that had cerebral palsy, was creating the, the tracks for the wheelchair. So actually creating the tracks for the wheelchair up on the glacier and actually pushing oh, pushing around. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, doing that. And then the, the challenge um, was around weight. So it was fine yeah. if they were a little bit, you know, if they were smaller lighter. and a bit lighter. Yeah. But the heavier um, they became, the more challenging that becomes yeah, a solution. About five years ago, I went on a tandem paraglide with a buddy of mine, Dino, down in Queenstown. And I was kind of like, this is pretty easy. I was never a paraglider before my injury. And then I was like, I think I can pull this off. So I came and worked with uh, Melrose and asked them kindly if they'd like to help me out. When I thought about making a buggy, I, I wanted somebody that understood exactly what good welds are with all the little bits and pieces. So again, I called old mate Phil, and boom, we came up with this baby. Yeah, basically got um, a few, few plans and stuff from Jezza here, and. Um, which was the frame, and we had uh, the suspension and the wheels that he wanted, and um, yeah, so we I came up with the uh, ways of mounting some of the machine parts. The suspension, if you have it in certain places, it weakens the whole back end, and it's like an aeroplane, you know, you come in quite hard when you land, so it's knowing that all the angles and everything, which is probably the most important piece, because as you can understand, you know, if you come in on the back weight, it, it's going to hit quite hard, and your back and all your weight um, on it as well. So that there was the delicate part. He's making all these dreams happen for people with like rafting or jumping out of a plane or jumping in one of these buggies and that going down a hill a million miles an hour and that. So he's making it happen for our next generations and that and not wrapping them up on cotton wool and going, no, you cannot do that. I'd rather be out there doing what I do 
than sitting around going, I can't because, because that just would not work for this mind. It would be impossible. The only licensed quadriplegic paraglider in New Zealand. It's been a process about five years, but they gave me my license. So that means I can fly whenever or wherever I like, but to a point, you know, I have to be a lot more onto it than average Joe. There's certain things that you can do if things go wrong when you're in the air. Things like pulling in your big ears, which makes the canopy half the size and it means you can come down fast. A speed bar or trimmers that roll your wing forward so you can penetrate the wind faster. And of course, reserve that you can throw if things go wrong. The last three of those things I don't have, so it's all about just being one with with the ear and reading my limitations and what I can do perfectly. It's the whole thing about using your mind to do something that makes you feel satisfied. And that's what this is all about. And independence. Independence is huge. Although I'm quite dependent like this. Karen, can you uh, tighten up my boy, these ones here, please? I had tremendous amount of respect for, for Jezza right from the word go, so I was really impressed by his attitude. His attitude, get there, do it, and beat it at all odds. <laughs> there was a lot of hoops and hurdles that we wanted to get through just to see that he could fly, so we did a lot of uh, groundwork. He flew with me in, in a tandem, and I got him to run the controls so he knew what to expect when he was flying. I was, like, looking at the ground, going, Whew, and I couldn't control my arms because my arms were stuck in behind my head and stuff. And I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. You know, I'm back in that realm. I made wrist loops for my wrists. What that means is I don't have to hold on to the lines. So when the canopy goes up, it pulls my arms up, yeah? So we hope that it is always up. So all I'm doing in reality is I'm just feeling my glider and I'm pulling it down with my shoulders. So it's about feeling everything through your body and then just going with the thermal, going with the wind. There was a lot of trial and error in order to work out from our point of view the correct way to launch him. But in the end, we decided with two instructors, one on each side, and having a helper like Karen helping to pull the buggy down, that was our best bet here. It is probably one of the most magic moments of anyone who has learned to fly is that lifting air and going up. Can totally understand why he wants to fly. His moment of freedom is when he is flying. I think anybody that has an ability like mine is limited by their imagination. It's all about perspective. It's important for people to realise that mindset is everything. Taking life as what it is, something that's extremely precious. It's all about using exactly what you got to run it as best you possibly can. You know, I don't admire them in parts. I admire the whole complete person. It's about being able to grow physically, mentally, spiritually because of a hurdle. 
get slowed down a little bit by a, an injury like I've got, but it doesn't really change me for who I am or what I do. was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.